what are the roots of Christian Zionism? The roots lie in a particular understanding and interpretation of certain texts in the Bible. One of these texts says, when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will this be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus gave them a long discourse about the end of days, but he concluded with the words, keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. It has become clear to many of us that the heart of the Israel-Palestine conflict is the ideology and theology of Zionism as it, is manifest, it, it has manifested itself in the theology and politics of Christian Zionism and probably a hundred years after in Jewish Zionism. So how do we define Christian Zionism? There are many definitions. In fact, we have with us today uh, more than one person who have written about this and have given definitions. I'm only going to use one definition which, uh, uh, which Don Wagner has written about. It says, Christian Zionism is a movement within Protestant fundamentalism that understands the modern state of Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy and thus deserving of political, financial, and religious support. When looking at all the material that I've studied, I think there are four major stages in the development of Christian Zionism. The first stage is the rise of restorationism from the 16th century to the end of the 19th century, from the Protestant Reformation to the establishment of the Zionist movement in 1897. As already mentioned, Christian Zionism is a Protestant phenomenon. And what amazes me is that from the very beginning, Anglican clergy and Anglican lay people played an important role in, the, in Christian Zionism. They believed that Jews must return to Palestine in order to usher in the second coming of Christ. And they were known in those days as restorationists. That is, they believed that Jews needed to be restored to Palestine before the second coming of Christ can take place. I have a list of people. I just want to mention their names. We don't have time to go into details. Uh, the Reverend Thomas Brightman, an Anglican clergyman in the 16th century who urged the British people to support the return of Jews to Palestine in order to hasten the return of Christ. Sir Henry Finch, a prominent member of the British Parliament, an Anglican, who was advocating for the same thing. The Reverend Louis Way, another Anglican clergyman in the early 1800s, was teaching that Jewish return to Palestine was necessary for the second coming. The London Jews Society was established in 1809 to encourage the physical rest restoration of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. John Nelson Darby, an Angli Irish Anglican priest who believed that the return of Jesus of Jews to Palestine was essential to God's plan. Darby is credited to be the father of dispensationalism. He believed that the Bible talks about seven dispensations, 
from the beginning of creation to the end of the world. And Darby came to the United States and preached his doctrine, and many people became his followers. William Blackstone was not an Anglican, but he's from the United States, was very influential American activist who played a significant role for the establishment of the State of Israel. In 1881, Blackstone lobbied President Harrison to send American Jews to Palestine. Another influential American, Cyrus Schofield, who in 1909 produced the Schofield Reference Bible printed by the Oxford University Press, which disseminated the teachings of dispensationalism to countless number of American evangelicals. Chief among those influential people was Lord Chaffsbury, another Anglican. For him, the return of Jews to Palestine was not only predicted in the Bible, it was important for the strategic interests of the British Empire. Now, you can see now how religion and politics begin to relate. The Anglican Church in Jerusalem started by people who wanted the return of Jesus, they wanted to convert the Jews, and so they established the bishopric in Jerusalem. Another Anglican clergyman who played a very important role was William Heckler. He too, he was a member of the CMJ, the Church Mission to Jews in those days. In 1896, 1896, Heckler met Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism. Herzl had just published his book, The Jewish State, but Heckler had already published his book entitled The Restoration of Jews to Palestine According to Prophecy. They became friends. And Heckler had a great influence on Herzl. It is important to note, my friends, the major Jewish denominations, Orthodox, Conservative and Reform, rejected Zionism. But during this first stage, the enthusiasm, the biblical research, the advocacy for the restoration of Jews to Palestine was all provided by Protestant Christians, especially in Britain and then in the United States. It's interesting to note that the people of Palestine did not matter. Nobody was thinking about them. They were invisible. The Jews had a role to play, but the most essential thing was the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. So this is the first stage. In 1897, Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, and the only Christian to be there was the Reverend William Heckler. Herzl called him the first Christian Zionist. And maybe this is where the terminology started being used about Christian Zionist. So when the Zionist movement came into being, the Christian Zionists were very excited. And the Schofield Reference Bible played an important role in popularizing Christian Zionism. It's happening. The Jews now are also involved. During this period, you find the collaboration between politically powerful Christian Zionists like Lord Arthur Balfour, 
Britain's foreign secretary, and influential Jewish Zionists like Chaim Weizmann. Herzl tried his best to find a sponsor to his project Christian Zionism, to his project of Zionism. But Herzl failed. He tried to get in touch with the German Kaiser, with the King of Italy, with the Tsar of Russia, with the Pope in the Vatican, with the Turkish Sultan, for someone, one of them, to sponsor the project of Zionism. None of them would do it. It was later on that Britain <coughs> sponsored Zionism in 1917. Before the British endorsed the Zionist project, they got in touch with the American president at the time, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was hesitant initially, but behind him stood an ardent Jewish Zionist, the Supreme Justice Louis Brandeis, who was a friend of Wilson. And within a few days, Wilson approved the, the Balfour Declaration. After World War I, after the war ended and the Turkish Empire disintegrated, Palestine came under the British mandate, and the first British High Commissioner was Herbert Samuel, a Jewish Zionist. His specific man mandate was to prepare the way for making Palestine a home for the Jews. By hindsight, we can see the web of conspiracy against the Arabs of Palestine. Indeed, the Americans endorsed the Balfour Declaration. The British were going to implement it. But behind both were Jewish and Christian Zionists, active, each working for its own from its own perspective and for its own objective to provide the political and theological underpinnings. When I reflect on this, I believe it was the beginning of the Nakba, the catastrophe, not only the political, but equally the theological and the moral Nakba. It all started in the minds and hearts of seemingly good people who honestly believed that they were doing God's will. But from the perspective of, the, of its victims, it was a stark colonial project that dealt a deadly blow to the indigenous people of Palestine, who had no say. They were invisible. Their destiny was being decided by the people of power. Again, powers, the powers trumped justice. During this period also, the tragic events of the Holocaust took place, and the Holocaust undoubtedly contributed much in increased sympathy for Jews after the, after the Second World War and for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. The third stage, again very briefly. 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel to 1967, war. This period is characterized by a, by a great euphoria for the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. For Christian Zionists, and according to their interpretation, it was exhilarating to see the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy of chapter 37 in the ingathering of Jews from the four corners of the earth. Indeed, Christian Zionists were disappointed to see an Israel which is secular, unwilling to acknowledge a divine hand in the establishment of Israel. Because Israel, when it was established in 1948, the leaders were all 
Zionist, secular Zionist. The rationale in those days for the establishment of the State of Israel was because of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. There has to be a, Jew, a, a Jewish state. But for the Christian Zionists, as far as they were concerned, the end times had already begun. And during this period, between 1948 and 1967, Israel was building its military power, and the, Zionist, the secular Zionists were in government. The 1967 war changed the political map of the area and the nature of Zionism itself. As far as the Christian Zionists was concerned, the occupation of East Jerusalem, especially the Haram area, the, what Jews would call the Temple Mount by Israel, marked a further sign of the approaching end. Now, Christian Zionists started looking for the rebuilding of the third temple to, in, to usher in the second coming of Christ. During this stage, the rationale changed. I mentioned the rationale under secular Zionism was anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Now, under, under religious Zionism, the rationale became God gave us the land. It's not the Holocaust. It's not anti-Semitism. It is God, it is the Bible. The Bible says it. A number of American Christian Zionists became actively involved during this period. Many of you have heard of Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, Hal Lindsey, and others like him. More recently, John Hagee topped the list in his involvement and commitment for Israel. Some of these people were very influential. Just one anecdote about Jerry Falwell. When he detected that President Bush called on Israel to withdraw its tanks from Palestinian towns on the West Bank, Falwell shut off a letter to protest of protest to the White House, which was followed by 100,000 emails from Christian conservatives. Israel did not move its tanks, and Mr. Bush did not ask again. That was the power of the Christian Zionists. The American Christian Zionists have their counterparts in Britain and in other places. In the words of Walter Riggins, the general director of Church Mission to Jews, Christian Zionists generally agree on three cardinal beliefs, allowing for a wide diversity of views as to their theological significance. Let me mention them to you. First, the, returns, the return of Jews to the land and the establishment of the State of Israel should be interpreted as a fulfillment of Old Testament promises and prophecies concerning the land as signs of God's continuing mercy and faithfulness to the Jewish people. Second, the establishment of the State of Israel has a special theological significance because of what it means for the Jews and what it means to the turning of the Jews, Jewish people, to their Messiah and the second coming of Christ. And thirdly, Christians should not only support the idea of a Jewish state, they need to support its policies as a sign of God's mercy and faithfulness. Can you believe this? That you have to support the policies of the state. Christian Zionism based these beliefs on several theological principles. The Bible is the literal and inerrant word of God. 
God's covenant with Israel is eternal and exclusive. Prophecy is the key to understanding world history and apocalyptic events. The end times and Armageddon are imminent. Someone might ask, what prompts a pro-Israel stance for evangelicals? I believe that conservative and literal biblical interpretation, especially of the Old Testament, is one of the things that prompts them. The end time role, which many of them believe about the second coming of Christ, some of them are prompted by the Holocaust guilt, others by Islamophobia. What is our critique of Christian Zionism? Few, just to mention few. Theologically, Christian Zionism is a Christian aberration. I would even say more than that, it's a Christian heresy. Because it corrupts the biblical message of love, justice, and peace. Christian Zionists are guilty of emphasizing an end of the world theology of violence that contradicts the heart of the gospel of love and mercy. The exclusive biblical text about God's promise of the land reflect a tribal understanding that had been surpassed and transcended even within the Old Testament itself. Christian Zionist belief in, a, in Jewish racial exclusivity and their divine right to inherit and control all the land of Palestine contradicts the inclusive message of the Bible in both Old and New Testament. And this is one of the, of the critiques which Jewish people articulate. On 11th of March, 2014, Eliakim Cohen posted a very interesting article, The End of Evangelical Support for Israel. The millennial, he says, the millennial generation of young believers, roughly ages 18 to 30, are rebelling against what they perceive as the excessive biblical literalism and political conservatism of their parents <laughs> as they strive with a renewed vigor to imitate Jesus stand with the oppressed and downtrodden they want to decide for themselves which party is being oppressed in the Arab Israeli conflict because many people think it is Israel that is oppressed this is the way propaganda works Whenever possible, we need to reach out to our Christian, Christian Zionists with love and care. And we need to encourage them to come and see for themselves what's happening back home. Because many of them come, but they never come to the West Bank. They never see what's really happening. But for us, Bible readers, Bible readings from the common lectionary or outside the common lectionary that reflect racist attitudes, exclusive and tribal theology must be avoided, my friends, must be avoided unless it is preached on and challenged. I go to churches, I see this, I cannot, sometimes I cannot bear to listen to the reading of the Bible in our mainline churches. We need to challenge those exclusive texts. We need to learn how to use the Old Testament as Jesus used it. Father Richard Rohr, Center for Contemplation and Action wrote, 
Jesus never quoted from the book of Numbers, which is rather ritualistic and legalistic. Jesus never quoted Joshua or Judges, which are full of sanctified violence. Jesus did not quote biblical texts that are punitive, imperialistic, or ex exclusionary. In fact, he taught the exact opposite in every case. When studying the Bible, it is important to remember the words of Paul, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. We need to conform to the spirit of Christ in reading the scriptures. It is, it is the words, the exclusive words, the exclusive text, literally taken, that bring misery and pain to us. These are, these are the texts that are being used by the, by the settlers against the Palestinians. The use of a hermeneutic of love can help us avoid many of those problems. We need to stand up for the human political and political rights of the Palestinians. We need to work against any form of discrimination and racism. We need to be against anti-Semitism, against Islamophobia, and anything else that dehumanizes people. We need to insist that peace in Palestine and Israel must be based on the principles of international law. We need to resist the Israeli occupation through nonviolent methods and means. Nonviolence, my friends, is the most radical challenge to oppression and injustice that Christians have at their disposal. Nonviolence threatens the oppressors and undermines the violence of the powerful. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions are legitimate nonviolent ways to be used in order to pressure Israel to stop its injustice. Let us remember the words of Thomas Merton. Peace demands the most heroic labor, the most difficult sacrifice. It demands greater fidelity to the truth and a much more perfect purity on conscience. To this, I invite you, my brothers and sisters. This is the challenge for all of us. We will continue to work for the establishment of a just peace for all the people of Palestine and Israel. Thank you.